conference, which is God's prophetic time clock. And my message is called The Permanence of the Promise, which is God Almighty being faithful in what he promised to do. So our text is in Romans chapter 9, and I'm going to read. Now, I got a big print Bible so I can see the print, and I still can't see the print. <laughs> so I don't like these glasses. I really don't, but it's no light here, so I don't want to be chewing over the words when I'm trying to look at them, and they just disappear on me. So be patient with me, because I like to do this, okay? But Romans chapter 9, verse 1. I'm going to start at verse 1 and read the 13. My, my verses are verses five, verses 6 to verses um, 13. He says, And I say the truth in Christ, I lie not. My conscience also bear me witness in the Holy Ghost that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. For I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh, who are Israelites to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants, and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises, who are, who, whose are the Father, and who, of whom, uh, as concerning the flesh, Christ came, who is over all. God bless it forever. Amen. Not as though the word of God have not taken, not as though the word of God have taken none effect. For they are not all Israel, which are of Israel, neither because are they the seed of Abraham are they the children. But in Isaac shall thy seed be called. That is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promises are counted for the seed. For this is the word of promise, at this time will I come, and Sarah shall have a son. And not only this, but when Rebekah had also conceived by one, even our father Isaac, for the children being not yet born, neither have done, done anything good or evil that the purpose of God according to election might stand. It was written, not a, might stand, not a works, but of him that calleth. It was said unto her, the elder shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, and Esau have I hated. So let me start that there. My wife warned me, she said, when the stars beep him, just cut it off, so. Okay, it's gone. Um, let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. We just give you honor and glory. Give us a clarity of thought, understanding of your purpose in Christ, uh, whether it be your purpose regarding Israel, your purpose regarding the, the body of Christ, but your eternal purpose and how that fits in this passage uh, that Paul has been given instructions to write to establish us. So we just thank you. We give you praise, honor, and glory in Christ's name. We pray. Amen. And my lesson is to demonstrate the security of God's purpose to Israel in spite of the failure of the Abrahamic descendants. When you get to the book of Romans, it's a book to establish us. It's a foundation book. So the pillars in Romans is four of them. First one is Romans 1 to 5 that deals with the issue of justification unto eternal life. How, how a believer comes as a sinner and gets saved by trusting in the finished work of Christ at Calvary alone. The second pillar is the issue of sanctification, how, how the believer is not only justified unto eternal life, but sanctified unto holiness, that you become a, a, new, a new identity is given to you in Christ. Then Romans chapter 9, 10, 11, Paul is dealing with the dispensational issue of Israel. What happened to Israel, what, what is their status now, and what's their future restoration? And then Romans chapter 12, the issue of the renewed mind where you begin to function as in this new identity in these different elements of life, whether it's the local church or whether it's the family, et cetera. So when you get to Romans chapter 9, 10, 11, the apostle Paul is establishing us on the issue of what happened to Israel. And what he does, he begins to go through this this issue of explaining those verses in, in Romans chapter uh, 9, verses 6 to 13. And I'm going to make some statements here, so let me just get to it. This is a bloody battleground passage. Uh, you all know about the doctrine of election, and there's a lot of information taught from this passage that is inaccurate. So let me say the first disclaimer. This passage is not talking about salvation. Amen. Some of you all shaking your head. So I know some folks out here don't believe that. Is this the way it is? Because they've been talking to some about reading the book. There was a book that I read a long time ago. It was called Election Before Time. It was a Calvinist book. And they took that per passage down, and we're going to get to it, where it talks about Jacob have I loved and Esau have I hated. And they started talking about the issue of God electing some to salvation and others to damnation. That's not what the passage is talking about. The other thing Paul is teaching in Romans chapter 9, 10, 11, historically, doctrinally, and dispensationally, is that you and I are not Israel. Never have been, never will be. God has a purpose still with Israel. So he's temporarily suspended his purpose with Israel to bring in an unprophesied program and form the church, the body of Christ. 
you know, one of the things about our title there, about God's prophetic time clock, this is what I see in the scriptures. When you start talking about God's promise, it's talking about the person of God himself coming to fulfill a promise. We'll get to that. And it's based on his promise, first of all, to Eve when he says the seed of the woman is going to destroy the serpent's head. That's the seed line. But it goes from Eve all the way over to Abraham. And then it becomes Abraham's called out, as you all know, a nation. That's what this chart is, that God calls out Abraham among the nations, and he makes a promise and a covenant with Israel. So as you go through that timeline, there are some things about God's purpose and grace to Israel when he brings them out of Exodus. And God wanted Israel to understand that I'm going to do everything that you need me to do for you. That's why in Exodus chapter 3, he told Moses to say, I am that I am have sent thee. And tell them that I am. And the issue there is two things, that God is timeless. God Almighty is an eternal God, so he's not working on our calendar. He's working for his purpose in time, but an eternal purpose. The other one is the noun, it's the subject, the verb, and the noun, the predicate. I am that I am, whatever you need me to be. And so as they come out the wilderness before they go to Mount Sinai and get that law contract, God is demonstrating to Israel through certain things that I'll be whatever you need me to be. But Israel in their pride and their flesh told God, give us a law and we'll keep it. So he did. So the issue of the law then becomes a contract, and brothers have gone over that. But in Leviticus 26, when you deal with the five courses of punishment, there's a time element of those punishments that happen through Israel's history until you get to the captivity. And when you get to Isaiah and following, you have the fifth course of punishment, but there's installments in those punishments. Five, five courses of punishment, five installments. So when Daniel does his time chart, that tells him how those courses are going to run with those installments. Now, when John the Baptist appears, you're in the fifth course in the fourth, fourth installment. And so Israel, if they studied that time count, they knew that the time of that kingdom was near. So here comes John the Baptist preaching, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And he begins to identify through a prescription for cleansing how Israel is going to get in that kingdom. They're going to be washed with water, John the Baptist's ministry. Matter of fact, Matthew chapter 3, he says, I indeed baptize you with water and repentance. It's talking to the nation because of their rebellion and defiance. He said, but he that comes after I, whose shoes I'm not worthy to bear, he's going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost day of Pentecost, and fire, second coming of Jesus Christ. So the prescription of cleansing had to do with them being washed with water, John the Baptist, and then anointed with oil, the baptism of the Holy Ghost in the early parts of Acts. In Luke chapter 13, when the parable is there about the extension of this time frame during the book of Acts, it's an extension of, of mercy and grace. Because the Lord has said in Matthew chapter 12, whosoever blasphemy against the Father is going to be forgiven him, Whosoever blasphemed against the Son is going to be forgiven him. But whosoever blasphemed against the Holy Ghost is not going to be forgiven him in this age or in the age to come. So they rejected God the Father through the prophets Israel did. They rejected the Son himself. But on the cross of Calvary, the Lord said something wonderful. He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. So Israel had another opportunity to repent. And he, as a matter of fact, Peter said, you did it out of ignorance. Because God Almighty allowed Israel to have some opportunity to accept him, the Lord Jesus Christ as their Messiah King, and that kingdom would come. Now here's my point. When you get to Acts chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7, when Stephen stands up and they blaspheme the Holy Ghost, they knew, the little flock of believers, that they had committed the unpardonable sin, Israel. The next thing on the time calendar, folks, was the wrath of God. Period. And yet, here's Saul of Tarsus gets saved. The wrath don't come. And when Paul understood and went to Peter, James, and John, and he teaches us that Israel's program has been suspended for a time and a reason for an unprophesied program that nobody knew anything about until the Lord raised up Paul, not as a friend, not based on covenants and promises, but as an enemy who was reconciled to God by the death of his son. And that the verse was read earlier that God concluded both Jew and Gentile in unbelief that he might have mercy upon all. God had us in mind all the time, folks. And yet, when Paul goes and he begins to explain that, that verse that Brother Ray read about 2 Peter chapter 3, when Peter says some of these things Brother Paul written, wrote is hard to understand, to them who are unlearned and unstable, who wrestle with the scriptures, 
it was explained Romans chapter 9, 10, and 11. That makes sense? You sure? Shake your head. <laughs> okay. Because this wasn't on the time frame. And I'm saying this prophesied program, and you all know this. I, I'm not going to pull the chart back. But the extension of mercy and grace, the wrath of God was supposed to pour here. But it's not going to pour until we get taken out of it. It's not going to be poured out. Because John the Baptist said that he told those Jews who came, those leaders in Israel, you generations of vipers, who's warned you to flee the wrath to come? And then Paul said, God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. So what I have to do in my lesson is go through proving that to you. <laughs> That's what we're supposed to do. Not hear me talk, but prove it, right? So I want to share something with you that I think is implicit in the scriptures. And I can't forget one thing more than anything else. The issue with this passage and the issue with God's purpose is this cross, folks. You see, Israel could never get these promises over here until he, God Almighty and the person of his son accomplished what Israel couldn't do for them. And God Almighty has done and will do everything that's necessary. Well, let me put it this way. It's been done. I don't even say it's already been done. But it's a, it's a time element now where God is doing something in the age of grace, forming the church, the body of Christ. And when we're taken out of here, that time clock starts because Israel's program is not over. It's suspended. Now, one of the challenges, Pastor Jordan has given us all verses we need to stick with in. So I can't go get Brother Dave's uh, verses. <laughs> I can't, can't go mess with them. So I have to stick like this, all right? So Romans chapter 9. I'm going to take some of Ray's because he's through. <laughs> Romans chapter five, 9, verse 5. Who are the fathers? That's Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Who is concerned in the flesh, notice this, Christ came. Who is over all, God bless it forever. Amen. Now, I'm not turning there, but you all know the verse in Romans 15, verse 8, where it says that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision, confirming the promises made unto the fathers. And so when Jesus Christ comes in his earthly ministry, he has a confirmation ministry. That's why he does the signs and miracles and the wonders. You all know that. But when he says in verse number six, this gets into my lesson, not as though the word of God had taken none effect. For they are not all Israel, which are Israel, neither because are they the seed of Abraham, are they all children. But in Isaac shall thy seed be called. That is, the children of, that is, they which are the, the children of the flesh, they are not the children of God. But the children of the promises are counted for the seed. For this is the word of promise. At this time I will come. Now notice this. At this time I will come. That's God himself. And he says, and Sarah shall have a son. So what's the promise here? Come over to Hebrews chapter 11. Because God made a promise to Abraham. Now, the other thing, when I got this big print Bible, the pages don't turn quickly. So if I say a verse to you, you might get there before I do. Hebrews chapter 11. Now, this is the issue of the issue of the chapter of faith. But I want you to see something about what God told Abraham and what Abraham responded to. Verse 8. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8. Everybody there? Okay. He says, by faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should afterwards receive for an inheritance, he obeyed and went out not knowing whether he went. Now the issue is his faith that he obeyed God. By faith, verse 9 says, he sojourned in the land of promise as a, strange, a stranger, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. What was the promise? Look at verse 10. For he looked for a city, what? Whose building and maker was who? Well, Abraham understood something. As Brother Ray said, that when God Almighty created this earth, his purpose was to come down and dwell on this earth. That's why his name is called Emmanuel, being interpreted what? God with us. But God had a purpose how he was going to do that. It was going to be through his son. So Abraham understood something about God's purpose on the earth, establishing a kingdom on this earth. And so he was looking for God to come down and build a city. And the issue is about it being whose, whose builder and maker is God, that's who's going to build that city. Let me put it this way. The city of New Jerusalem is going to come down here. 
And God's going to establish his kingdom down here through redeemed Israel, who's, gonna, who's the channel of blessing to repossess this earth back for God with the adversary. So what Adam's put here to do and they didn't do, God Almighty is going to form forms the nation of Israel for them to accomplish for God through their Messiah what they didn't do through their redeemed Israel. I think I said that right, right? Okay. Now, go down to the passage because it's, it's something I want to get out of here. If I mess that up, forgive me. Verse 11, through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful who had promised. Now, that's the issue over in Romans chapter 4, but it's also the issue when Sarah and Abraham were past age. And Abraham learned something in Romans chapter 4. You know what Abraham learned? That in his flesh he couldn't please God. You know what you and I have to learn? That in our flesh we can't please God. And so Abraham, God Almighty waited to Abraham and Sarah. He promised Abraham a seed. But he waited until they couldn't produce the seed, and then he did that for them what they couldn't do for themselves. Now, it's going to get down to passage because it's kind of where I want to get to, where Abraham has Isaac. Because it talks about over in Romans chapter 9 that it wasn't Ishmael that was the promised seed. It was Isaac. And that principle over in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 talks about the first is natural, but the second one is spiritual. So that's why the Lord Jesus Christ told Nicodemus, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say unto thee, ye must be born again. So the promise that God made was not going to be what Abraham can do from, through his flesh. He created Ishmael. And you know how that worked out. So God Almighty had to teach Abraham a lesson. I have to do for you what you can't do for yourself. But even more spectacular than that, then he asked Abraham to give his only son. And I'm going to do this so I can get through my lesson because i got some things I don't want to get bogged down. Because you all know the story. <clears throat> Where Abraham goes up in the mountain and Isaac looks at him and says, Father, I see the wood and I see the altar, but where's the offering? And what did, God, what did Abraham say to Isaac? The Lord will provide. What kind of faith is that, boy? And so then when Abraham's ready to offer his only son, a type of the Lord Jesus Christ, that God the Father gives his son as a propitiatory sacrifice for our sins, not that we deserved it or could earn it, but God in his great love for us. And when, when Abraham goes back and the angel tells him to withhold that hand and he sees that ram there, he calls that place Jehovah Jireh. The Lord will provide. And then he said, it shall be in the mount here. Let me read the verses so I can then make the application for that. Uh, verse number 13. These all died in faith, not having received the promises. That's that city. And eternal life, by the way, which is implicit in the Abrahamic covenant. We'll get to that in Gen uh, Galatians. But he says, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on earth. Is that you? Is that how you look like being here on earth? Why do you think after I said about the establishing people in that edification structure, when Paul talks about godly edification, which is in faith, so do, that when you get over to Romans chapter 8, you understand that God Almighty has saved you, but not only saved you, gave you a new identity in Christ. I'm kind of getting off track, but it's okay because I'm supposed to go off track and going off track. <laughs> Where you find out in Romans chapter 6, 7, and 8 that you're dead to sin, you're alive in the God, and now you're supposed to be a son and co-labor with them. But I understand the issue of godliness is that you think like God the Father, you walk like God the Son, and you labor with God the Holy Spirit. Who do you think like? The verse that said, Abraham said, this is not my home. You know, sometimes believers don't think that. They never understand that part of our transformation and regeneration is to think differently than we used to think. But I can't think any differently unless I get in that book and that book gets in me. And I began, as my brother and I were talking yesterday, I began to obey it. Let me go down through the rest of the passage. That was a sidebar. Then he says this, verse 14, for they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a what? A country. 
Now, I want you to see some verse number 17. Well, verse 16. But, but now they desire a better country that is a heavenly, wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. Notice he's prepared. Is that future tense or past tense? Past. Prepare. It's already done. You know, my wife, I come home and she gets upset when I don't do this. She says, I've already prepared you a meal. And she'll put it on the table. She's over there, so she'll attest to this. And if I don't get up there and eat it when it's on that table, I'm in trouble. <laughs> she didn't say, I'm preparing you a meal. I, I prepared you one. It's ready to be eaten. Abraham understood that. Now watch verse number 17, because I, I quoted it earlier. By faith, Abraham, when he was tried, that was, he, he was tested, offered Isaac, and he that received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called, accounting that God was able to raise him up. That's the issue of eternal life, folks. Abraham understood that not only in that covenant that God made with him was the promise of a kingdom, but he had to live long enough to get it. It had to be implicit in the covenant that God made with Abraham. But watch the last part of the verse. Accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, whence he also received in a figure. Now, it's fascinating to me when the Lord Jesus Christ met with those religious rulers in John chapter 8. And he said, Abraham saw my day and was glad. And they said, you, you're not over 50 years old. And he says, before Abraham was, I am. He comes to confirm the promises. That's God in human form. And Abraham understood that it was going to be God himself that was going to come through his loins in the purpose of, uh, uh, as, as the covenants that he made with him through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now that's going to make sense when we get back to our passage. And you understand the issue there about the election had to do with that agency that God's going to use. It had nothing to do with the men. They were from Adam. It had to do with what God was doing and what his son was going to accomplish through that cross. And when Abraham said that it shall be this way in the mount, it shall be seen in Genesis chapter 22, he understood something about a redeemer coming, folks. Without a redeemer coming, none of the promises of God can be accomplished. But you know who that redeemer is? It's God himself. The second person of God here left heaven's glory and came down to redeem sinners like you and I. Now, that's the unprophesied program. But there's a promise that is made about the seed of the woman and about Abraham's seed. Now, come over to Galatians chapter 2, uh, Galatians chapter 4. Oh, no, stop. Go to Hebrews chapter 6. I have notes up here. You know I have notes up here? No, really. <laughs> I'll go somewhere where I'm not supposed to go first to prove something. Because my title is the permanent of the promise. In other words, why are all these things going to happen for you and I? We'll see this at the end for the church, the body of Christ. Because, by the way, I'll just throw it out there. We're called the elect. We're God's agency today in the earth. And, and I'll jump ahead, just kind of throw it out there for you. Because the agency is put here by God to serve him. That's why you're here. You've been bought with a what? You all know that verse, huh? And so you're supposed to glorify God and your body and your spirits, which are what? It said he is. Do you think that way? Wow, that's powerful. Isn't it? That really is powerful. Isn't it? So you start thinking differently. You start functioning differently. Because this is not about my eternal life. This is about my functional life. How do I function in this world? as an ambassador for Christ. That's why we're here. Thank God for the conferences. I, it's a joy, by the way. Thank you for allowing me the privilege to be here, to be a part of what, you, what, what God is doing with us. The honor and to be able to meet new people is just special. You know, just a real good time of fellowship, not only through his word, but through meeting one another. There's been a lot of people I met this week, and just a real joy. Lifelong friends. I knew Brother Mel. I don't know if that means I'm old, I was going to say, not as old as, okay, I'm not. I love him, so I won't do that. 
Hebrews chapter 6, about the issue of the promise. Verse 13. For when God made promise to Abraham, when God made promise to Abraham, and by the way, this is when he made a promise to you too, because he can swear by no greater, what did he do? He swore by himself, saying, Surely I will bless thee and multiplying, and I will multiply thee. And so after Abraham had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. Well, he didn't get the promise yet over here, but he saw it afar off. But watch what he says. For being verily swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife, wherein God willing more abundantly to show the heirs of the promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things, one is that kingdom, folks, but the other one is it was impossible for God to lie. And that's the issue of Hebrews talking to those circumcision believers on the basis of that new covenant. That's how they're going to get it. Not through the works of their flesh. Jesus Christ and the time calendar of Leviticus 23 had to first come to be the Passover lamb. He's already done that. That's Calvary. Paul said Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. And then that time calendar in Leviticus 23 is more than one in the Bible, by the way. It's the unleavened bread. That's his barrel. And this is the first fruits, his resurrection from the dead. And when Peter says in Acts chapter 2, when the day of Pentecost said what? Fully come. Historically, those things are done in Israel's time calendar. There were three things left to be done. The trumpets, the day of atonement, and the millennial kingdom. It's not here. What happened? Verse that said God promised it's going to happen. Now, you know what the Bible says about God not lying. It says God is not a man that he should lie. Then it says God who cannot lie. Then it says in Hebrews it's impossible for God to lie. He threw his eyes up at when I did that. That's what it says. Balak said God is not a man that he should lie. Paul said in hope of eternal life which God that Hello. <laughs> then the Hebrew writer says, not only that, but it's impossible for God to God. That's his veracity. Those are two immutable things. They don't change. God's promise for Israel is going to happen when he's finished with the formation of the church of the body of Christ. But the other thing is that God's promise and purpose for us is going to happen too. Now, the authority today has been said is this book that tells me that. I believe that by faith. I believe that by faith. All right? Now, now we can go back. We can go over to Galatians chapter 4. I want you to see something here. We're going to get to the bloodbath over there in uh, Romans chapter 9. By the way, 2 Corinthians chapter 1 says, All the promises of God are in him are yea and yea. When Paul's dealing with the Galatians saints about going back into the law, and he's coming and using corrective doctrine, he, he does something, he calls it an allegory in Galatians chapter 4. I said Galatians, right? Verse 22, for it is written that Abraham had two sons. By the way, that's the veracity of scriptures. It's written. He's pointing back to a historical event that happened. And it, it explains what's going on in Romans chapter 9 too. It adds to that. The one by a bondmaid and the other one by a free woman. Now that's Hagar and Sarah. He says, but he that was of the bondwoman was born how? After flesh. That's why it says in Romans chapter 4, verse 1, he says, Abraham, my father, pertained to flesh if found. But if Abraham were justified by works, he had word of the glory, but not before God. But what saith the scriptures? Abraham believed God and was counted to him for righteousness. Abraham learned that when he tried to help God accomplish the purpose and promise, he messed everything up. I always like somebody to identify with that. Yeah, see, she, she, don't even, she don't even know us. She hasn't been around here, but she know about us messing up stuff. <laughs> you know, it's three different types of uh, suffering in this world. You know that, don't you? You say you didn't know that? Romans chapter 8 talks about the sufferings of this present time. I talked to Brother Earl. He's going to have surgery. Not because he did anything wrong. We're not in Israel's program of the covenants of 
blessings and curses because he's in this present evil world. And because God Almighty interrupted the prophetic program with the age of grace and he suspended all their promises and covenants. And by the way, he offers us something far greater, the sufficiency of his grace. Strength being made perfect. Somebody said that, Brother Ricky, yesterday, peace being made, strength being made perfect in weakness and the peace of God that passeth all understanding. My goodness. Something a lot better. But our new bodies are coming. So the one we're in right now, it goes to suffering. Uh, he's going to have surgery. Suffering is his present time. Three types of suffering. Then there's the suffering for stupidity. <laughs> I thought you all would like that one. Let me hear an amen, sister. <laughs> Give me an amen over there. This is like stupid, dumb decisions. Time makes that a little better. You don't make them as often. And it's frequent. They still come, though, at least for me. And then there's the sufferings of Christ. The one to, that you learn about who you are and you choose to willingly serve the Lord in that capacity. So we don't have to help God in our flesh today. Everything we need has already been accomplished in the crosswork of Christ at Calvary, folks. Everything we already need. We need to get in the book and find out about it, right? So Abraham, when he had sex with Haggai, here comes Ishmael. And he said to God, when God told him about that one's going to be the promise, he said, oh, that Ishmael may live before thee. And God said, cast out the bondwoman and her son. He's not going to be heir with the free one. See, what he's teaching Abraham, that whatever you need, I'm going to do it for you. And I'm going to do it, and this is a good one, on the basis of my grace and my grace alone. And Abraham understood something. And the lesson is for us to understand that today, too. So when you go down through the passage, he's talking about two covenants. Verse number 24, which things are an allegory. It's a story he's going to tell us. For these are two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai, which gendered the bondage, that's the law program, which is Hagar. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and ascends to Jerusalem, which is now, now is, and is bondage with her children. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free. That's the issue of Isaac being of the promise and the issue of grace. And then he goes down to the passage, verse 28. Now we, brethren, as Isaac's word was, are the children of the promise. But as it was then, I'm not going to read the rest of that because it's not pertaining to our lesson. But come back to Romans chapter 9. Now, I did that first before I got to the other part of the lesson because it says that in verse number 7 of Romans 9, neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they the children. But in Isaac shall thy seed be called. By the way, when the Lord told those religious rules in John chapter 8, he said, they said, we be of Abraham's seed and never been in the bondage. He said, I know you're Abraham's seed, but, but if you were Abraham's children. See, there's a difference of being a physical descendant of Abraham and being a child of faith. Amen. See, if you were Abraham's children, you would know I was coming because Abraham looked for my day and he was glad. Wow. So the children of the promise are the spiritual descendants of Abraham. They're not the physical descendants, and that's what you're going to see going down through this passage. It wasn't Ishmael. It wasn't Isaac. It wasn't Esau. It was Jacob. It wasn't the one that man did, it was the one that God did. And your natural birth, your physical birth is not the issue with God. It's the second one. It's the spiritual birth. Because that's going to be spiritual and eternal. Now let's get down to the meat. Y'all ready for this part? I got 14 minutes to finish this. Now watch what he says. Verse number 10. And not only this, but when Rebecca also conceived by one, even our father Isaac, for the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the what? The purpose of God, notice what? The purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. It was said unto her, here's the key, the elder shall serve the younger. Well, where was that said at? Come back to Genesis chapter 25. Two covenants and two nations. Now I'm going to have to speed up. So, I was listening, I think it was um, Brother 
Brother Dale said he had about 15 or 12 pages of notes. <laughs> I didn't have that many. But sometimes you get to going through these verses and you say, okay, how can I condense this to get through my point and prove my lesson, to prove what the scriptures say? So Genesis chapter 25, here's, here's the scripture, verse number 21. And Isaac entreated the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And the Lord was entreated of him. I'm in Genesis 25, 21. I want you to see this. Of him, and Rebecca, his wife, conceived. And the children struggled together within her. They're twins. And she said, if it be so, why am I thus? It's not so much to ask the qu important to ask the question, uh, what, but why? <laughs> why? What's going on here? And she went in to inquire of the Lord. That's Jehovah, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital G. D. And the Lord said to her, watch this, two nations are in thy womb, and what else? Two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels, and the one boy shall serve the other one. Is that what it says? The one people. The one people shall be stronger than the other people, and the elder shall serve the younger. He's talking about the nations that come out of Jacob and Esau. Well, how do you know that? Come over to Malachi chapter 1. The issue of election, folks, has to do with not... In, in the Word of God, the only... Conditional election God has is that you place in faith exclusively alone and Jesus Christ finished work at Calvary when you realize that you're the guilty, hell-bound sinner for whom Christ died. There's a condition on that. It's the issue of your faith. You have to believe God. But once you trust the Lord Jesus Christ to be your Savior, then God and the Holy Spirit takes you and he puts you in God's unconditional purpose of election to be a part of the body of Christ. There's an individual reconciliation. There's a reconciliation into the body of Christ. One is I have to put faith in Jesus Christ. The other one is once I put faith in Jesus Christ, God puts me in Christ, and I'm part of his eternal purpose. That makes sense? You sure? Somebody do like that if it doesn't. Malachi chapter 1. 11 minutes. Verse number 1. The burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. I have loved you, saith the Lord, yet you say, Wherein have we have thou loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, saith the Lord, yet I love Jacob. Now that's a quotation over in Romans chapter 9, right? But watch the rest of it. Whereas Edom saith, We are in promise, but we will return and build the desolate places, thus saith the Lord of hosts. They shall build, but I will throw down, and they shall call them the borders of wickedness and the people against the Lord whom have the Lord has indignation. Now he's talking about the, the nations. He's talking about Israel and he's talking about Edom. And when he says Jacob have I loved, he's talking about the nation that came out of Jacob. He's not talking about Jacob the individual. The two manner of people and the two nations that come out of them. That makes sense. Because the issue is the elect nation of the Abrahamic covenant. It's not going to be the one of the flesh. It's going to be the one of the spirit. It's not going to be the first one. It's going to be the second one. It's not going to be the one that Abraham did. It's going to be the one that God did. And that's a principle that works through the word of God. Now, verse number two, I have loved you, saith the Lord. Did the, love, did the Lord love Israel? Did he love them with an everlasting love? Did he, did he love them because they deserved his love? Did he love them because he was God and he chose to love them? Yeah, he did. So let me make the application. Did the love Lord, love you because you deserve to be loved? I like that. Yeah. Did he love you because he's a God? God is love? How did God Almighty demonstrate his love to you and I, folks? Right there at Calvary. Do you ever have to doubt the love of God? Paul said he loved me. He gave himself for me. God commended his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Not when I got right, I never could get right. I come from my daddy who came from his daddy. I like her. She did it twice again. I always get one in the audience when I'm here. They, yeah. <laughs> but it was the love of God that was manifested at Calvary. Man, what great love is that? And because we're part of the body of Christ, let me say, folks, that's why when that 
the book talks about that you're complete in him, you've been accepted in blood. I was sharing with my wife the other day, sometimes believers, when they're new to the faith and, and they misunderstand the issue of identity and the believer's walk and our functioning in, in, a, in a, what Paul calls godly edification or the issue of godliness, they go out and they get contaminated by sin again. And you know what happens to a lot of new believers? Well, then the guilt and shame comes from the old man who condemns them. And you know what they do? They leave us. Because all of a sudden, there's something I have to do to earn God's acceptance. They haven't come to understand and appreciate the cross yet. And that my acceptance is never based on what I could ever do. It's all based on what he's already done for me. And I live in that no matter how I feel. No matter when I mess up, because he had to do it all, okay? Now, let's go back to the pastor's because I got eight minutes. There are four different groups identified in the Bible as being the elect. There are people who teach that the issue of election in Romans chapter 9 has to do with salvation. As I started off earlier saying that Romans 9, 10, and 11 is a doctrinal and a dispensational exposition of what happened to Israel. Because if God called out Israel and had a purpose with Abraham, and we saw that the purpose that God Almighty had with Abraham, God's going to fulfill that himself. So that's why I said when you get over to the extension of mercy and grace, and by the way, when Peter talks about in Acts chapter 5, he, he tells those religious leaders that repentance to Israel. And when you understand that time calendar and the day of Pentecost had fully come, then it wasn't something new that started on the day of Pentecost. It was a continuation of something God had already started with Israel. That's too simple. That's too clear. That's amazing to me. It just fits. And when Stephen stood up, he says, you, you, you've always resisted, the, you stiff-necked it, and circ uncircumcised in the heart, you've always resisted the Holy Ghost. That's the sin that wouldn't be forgiven. The blasphemy of the Holy Ghost. And God in his marvelous wisdom and his eternal purpose suspended that program and saved Saul of Tarsus as an enemy. Sent him to the nations with his ministry of reconciliation to the world and to Gentiles that have been given up because of idolatry. In Genesis chapter 11, because they didn't think like God the Father, they didn't function like God the Son, and they didn't labor with God the Holy Spirit. That's Romans chapter 1. So they were ungodly. And he gave them up over to Satan. And folks, that's you and I. Not only were we given over to idolatry, but we were given to Satan. That's Ephesians chapter 2. Do you appreciate the hopeless condition we were in if the dispensation of grace wouldn't have come in? I do. Not only did he set Israel aside and break down that middle wall partition that was between us, but he sent his son not only to die for our sins, but to get us out of the bondage of sin and the grips of the adversary. And it's amazing to me, we didn't even know it. At least I didn't. I was lost at that point in time in my life. Now, five minutes. Four different groups that are elect. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, Paul talks about the elect angels. Now, there are angels that sinned, and there are angels that didn't sin. So I know according to Hebrews chapter 2, in order to save those angels that sinned, Jesus Christ would have to take on the nature of an angel. He didn't do that. He took on the seed of Abraham. So when it's talking about those elect angels, it's not talking about salvation. Angels are called in the Bible ministering spirits. They're called servants of God. They're here to serve. They're elect. In Isaiah chapter 42, the Lord Jesus Christ is called mine elect, mine servant. The Lord Jesus Christ had no sin, folks. He knew no sin. Who has made sin for us? The Lord didn't have to be saved. It was you and I. In order to be able to save me, he couldn't be contaminated with sin like I was. So he who knew no sin was made sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. It's not talking about salvation. He came to serve. He said, I came to seek and save that was lost. I'm, I'm not come to be the minister, be ministering unto, but to minister and give my life a ransom for many. Come back to Romans chapter 8. In Mark chapter 13, Israel is called the elect. And the Lord said, except those days be shortened, 
no flesh will be saved, but for the elect's sake. So that issue of election has to do with the agency that God's using at different times for his program. Today it's you and I. And it's not a term used for salvation, it's a term used for God's agencies at different times. Now I'm going to close out with this, okay? Because I've got three minutes. And if I don't close out with this, I'm going to take it. If I've got another minute, I'm going to take it. But he says in verse number, and by the way, when you get to Romans chapter 8, Paul's dealt with the issue of establishing these believers. The issue of justification, Romans chapter five, 1 through 5. The issue of sanctification, truth, Romans 6, 7, and 8. And then he talks about us being uh, the children of God by faith in Jesus Christ and being heirs. But he also talks about us being sons. We've received the adoption, folks. God doesn't look at you as a child. He looks at you as a full-grown adult in Christ. And the issue today is to be motivated by grace. But when he goes down to the passage to show the surety, he shows the issue of eternal security in Romans chapter 5, but the question would come up when he says these verses I'm about to read, well, why did God give away Israel? If all these things are true about us, then what happened to Israel? And that's when he goes to that dispensational issue of establishing believers in Romans chapter 9, 10, and 11. Now, I don't think I had to tell you all that, but that's what's there. That was my lesson. So when I get over to Romans chapter 12, he says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God that you do what? Present your bodies as a living sacrifice. I cannot tell a baby to do that. Spiritual baby. They're not ready. They have to have that godly edification, that curriculum put in them, that God the Holy Spirit begins to work in them, both the willing to do of his good pleasure, that they're willing to do it now. Are you willing to do that? When you leave this conference, are you willing to go, not suffer for stupidity, or because you're suffering this present time, Romans chapter 8. We can't do, or you can do something about the suffering for stupidity, but the suffering for this present time, you can't. But the sufferings of Christ is something that God wants you and I to do willingly. Can you say that today? And if you can't, then you ought to, because he gave his best. I beseech you, therefore, brother, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And don't be conformed to this world, but be you transformed by this the renewed mind. It's what we're learning. I have to get that old stuff out and get God's stuff in and begin to apply it to my daily life so I can function in this world and be a servant. And he goes down through that passage in Romans chapter 12 to 16. Now, Romans chapter 8, I can close now because i got one minute. Verse 31, Paul then summarizes when he says, what shall we say to these things? I love this passage, folks. If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, the unsparing God, folks. He didn't spare his son. He, it said it pleased the father to bruise him. <laughs> his soul was an offering for sin. He, he took upon himself the wrath and the eternal judgment and transformation of his soul being likened unto that second death that was for me and for you. Not because he deserved it. Because he was dying on that cross to pay for my sins and dying on that cross to pay for your sins. That the justice of God could be satisfied. And the holiness of God could be vindicated so the righteousness of God could be executed and imputed to you through Christ. Verse number 33, who shall lay anything to God's, okay, I stopped it. Who shall lay anything, I need five seconds, to the charge of God's elect. See what we call that there? It is God to justify. Who the, the condemneth is Christ who died. And I'm going to jump down just four times say, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? You all know the passage. Verse number 38, Paul says, for I'm persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come. No height, no depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Our salvation, our eternity is set because he who promised it is able to accomplish the promise. Father, we just thank you for this time. We give you honor and glory in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Yeah.